<coughs> excuse me. Well, tonight, if you have your Bible, we're going to start in James, or not James, in Romans chapter 2. Romans chapter 2. Last Wednesday, we uh, went through Romans chapter 1. And uh, I'm calling this teaching the Roman American way. And we talked about how similar Rome and America is in its history, uh, in its uh, founding, in, in the characteristics of the people and the culture. Uh, it's, it's, it's like looking in a mirror. And the great thing about um, Rome was they were powerful and uh, they had peaks that no other people had ever met and no other nation had met, but they had great moral decay. They had great spiritual decay from within, and, and ultimately it collapsed upon them. And America is going down the same road. We are going down, we're stopping at the same stops, we're, we're installing the same things. Uh, so that's why we need to know, how do we combat this? How do we combat so that America doesn't fall the way Rome did? Well, the answer is Jesus, always. The answer is Jesus, and the answer is the church, being the church, and being what we're supposed to be. And nothing tells us better than that than the book of Romans. The book of Romans is an amazing road uh, to the gospel and to what Jesus wants. And uh, we covered in chapter 1, last Wednesday night, about how... Um, we kind of got a State of the Union. We had a State of the Union the other night by President Obama. Well, Paul kind of gave us the State of the Union of Rome. And he talked about how uh, they had become smarter than God in their own eyes. And they didn't need God. And they didn't honor God. And, and it led to sin and corruption. Well, in chapter 2, Paul begins to focus on us, the church, the religious people, the Jews. He begins to talk to the church and tell them, now, Chapter 1 is easy because we can say, yeah, those sinners are acting like that. and Yeah, well now, chapter 2, he brings it around to us. <laughs> he brings it around to the church and says, now this is where the church is dropping the ball. And, and I can tell you, just by being a minister, and you could probably tell me just by your uh, uh, years on this earth and seeing the church of America. And I mean, uh, not denominational, not movement but just the church as a whole in America, we have been in the decline. We have been in the retreat. And, uh, and there's reason for that, and there's calls for that. And we're going to talk about some of those things tonight of how we don't let it happen at Northgate. Uh, we can't control what happens around the world, but we can control what happens in this part of the world because this is where we're at. So we're going to look at some things that Paul brought out and said these are some things of the reason why things are starting to get bad is because... The church wasn't being the church that it needed to be. And the thing about God is if you will be what God wants you to be as a church, as a person, as a mom, a dad, whatever, it's amazing how God will change things if we'll just be what we're supposed to be. Amen? Amen. Okay, so let's read. Uh, honey, go ahead and bring up Romans chapter 2. And uh, we're going to read a little bit here. And, uh, we, and he begins to talk about judgment. Uh, and one thing before we read anything is the Bible says that judgment comes to the house of God first. If God ever brings judgment on the world, it will come to the churches first before it ever comes to the world. That's the way God is it, because God expects more of us than the world. We are the ones that have, that have found the answer. We're the ones who have found the light. We're the ones who have surrendered our life. We've been through the blood. We've, been, we've got the Holy Ghost. We've got the fire of God. God expects more of us because we have been living in this. And this is where he gets into this, and we're going to talk about some things. He says now, he says, you may think you can condemn such people, like we talked about last week, the the, we talked about you know homosexuality, we talked about perversion, we talked about um, Hollywood, we talked about everything last week. He says, you may think you can condemn such people, but you are just as bad. So Paul's not pulling any punches here. He says, but you are just as bad, for you have no excuse. When you say that they are wicked and should be punished, you are condemning yourself. For you who judge others do these very same things. And we know that God, in His justice will punish anyone who does such things. Now, right off the bat, what, what Paul is telling the Roman church, now he's talking to the Jews tonight, but I want to bring it to us, the, the church here, and, and to, to our movement and to, and to America and what the church should be here. What has happened into the church 
And you can see it as well as I can, maybe not here at Northgate, but you've probably heard stories or whatever, of church people have become so judgmental of everything that's going on out there that we've forgotten that there's some things that we should be working on too in here. Amen? And what has happened is we have forgotten that there is no level in sin. We have tried to personalize and humanize sin and acts of sin. And what I mean by that is it only makes sense for us as human beings on this planet that, that have lived long enough that if I go into a grocery store, if I go into Walmart right across the road there, and I go in there and I steal a pack of gum, I go in there, I want some gum, I take some gum, I put it in my pocket and I steal, and I go right out the door and I stole, okay? Well, someone comes in right behind me, and they don't want to steal. They want to come in, and they want to kill as many people as they can. So they go in behind me, and they pull out an AK-47, and they just start mowing people down. In our sight, we say, well, the person who stole the little piece of candy, the people who stole the little gum, they don't deserve a, more, a severe punishment as the person that came in and started mowing people down. Right? Makes sense. Makes sense to us, and rightfully so. The punishment needs to fit it. But understand, in God's world, in God's economy, there is no high sins, low sins, little sins, big sins that deserve different levels of punishment. In God's eyes, the person who stole the piece of gum and the person who mowed down people in cold blood and murdered them are both on, the, on their way to the same hell. Because there is no level in sin. There is no levels. And I know it's hard for us to separate ourselves from that, but if we're going to understand the, what he's saying here to the church, we've got to understand that this is where Paul's coming from. This is the knowledge he's coming from. Because James said it in the book of James. He said, for to be guilty of one is to be guilty of all. So if you're a liar in God's sight, you're, you're in God's sight in sin, you look the same to him as a child molester. You look the same. You're both covered in sin. Both need redeeming grace. Both need the, the blood of Jesus. But here's the great thing. If I may have done a little bit of sin and come to Jesus and said, well, God, I'm not that bad of a guy, but I've done this and this and this. The blood covers me and forgives me. But the child molester, the ones that come in, the homosexual, the, the, the rapist, all these, when they come in, they get covered by the same blood I do. And they stand next to me just as redeemed as I am. Praise the Lord. So understand that when he's telling the church, he says, now, here's where you've dropped the ball, church. He said, you can sit in the church house and condemn the world of all their sin. He said, but if you have sin in your life, he said, you're no better than they. You're, you're no different than the people you're trying to condemn. And he even goes on, let's read further in verse 3. He says, since you judge others for doing these things, why do you think you can avoid God's judgment when you do the same things? Now, when he's talking about the same things, he's not necessarily, I guess in some cases he could be, talking about the very same acts of sin. But what he's talking about is sin, period. If you're involved in sin, then you're a sinner. And for us to come here and be like, well, at least I'm a sinner that comes to church. That doesn't come any merit with God. Okay? <laughs> you know, at least I'm a sinner that goes to church. That doesn't, that's not going to get you any points with God. It's not. So understand that, and he even touches that on that in here in a little bit. Um, so understand he's saying, if we are not being the people of God that we're supposed to be, then the culture will reflect it. The culture will reflect it. It will reflect around us because instead of us being a light to the world, we're just dark, but we're doing it inside a church and they're doing it out in the world. Does that make sense? Okay, he says in verse 4, Don't you see how wonderfully kind, tolerant, and patient God is with you? Does this mean nothing to you? Can't you see that his kindness is intended to turn you from your sin? But because you are stubborn and refuse to turn from your sin, you are storing up terrible punishment for yourself. Paul begins to plead to them about the kindness of God. He says, Guys, don't you understand how kind and the grace of God, the grace in which we stand right now, God did not give that to us so that we could think less of sin. God didn't give us grace as a, as a welcome mat for our, sin, for our sin-filled shoes as we come in and out of the house of God. 
God gave us grace out of his kindness so that we could put sin away from us. So that we could bring so that we could have the biggest gap between us and sin that there is possible. And that's the blood of Jesus. Amen. So the philosophy and we're going to get into some philosophy in Romans. He goes on and on about it. But before we're out of Romans, you're going to understand grace and, and what it is and what it isn't. Grace is not liberty to sin. God didn't give us grace so that we can like, well, I can tell a lie every now and again, but God will forgive me. No, that's not what grace is for. I don't have to do everything right because we're under grace and, you know, God will forgive me. No, that's not what grace is. Grace, the kindness of God, uh, is intended for us to get as far away from sin as we can. It's to empower us to get away from sin. But he says, because you're stubborn... And refuse to turn from your sin. And believe you me, there is a culture rising up in America, and it's been here for a while, of people who are stubborn when it comes from laying down their sin and turning from their sin. Because they want God and their sin. Amen? Amen. Um, um, I call it country music Christianity. Amen. Ain't got nothing wrong with country music. But country music has done more and caused more trouble of misunderstanding of God than, I, than any other thing I've ever seen in my life. Why? Because the other day, I'm flipping through the channels, and I, and I hear some dude, and he's singing, I got Jesus and Bocephus. <laughs> now, if you don't know who that is, we know who Jesus is. Bocephus is Hank Williams Jr. And he's talking about how his life is so great because he can drink it up with Hank, and then he can cry it up with Jesus, and he's got Jesus and Bocephus, and they're going fine. That's not how it works. Sorry. And I know that's against the country cowboy culture. And I know I'm in cowboy country. But understand, you can't have Jesus and the world. One will be your master. And, you'll, and, you'll, and, and the thing is, when you let the world come into it and you're picking between the world and Jesus, 99% of the time you're going to pick the world. Because the world knows you. It knows your flesh. It knows the weaknesses of your flesh. And therefore, it's going to be like, hey, do you really want to pray or do you want to party? <laughs> and guess what? Our flesh is going to be like, hey, let's party. So understand what he's saying here. He said God gave us kindness. God gave us his mercy and his grace and all that good stuff so that we could turn away from sin. He said, but the culture has become so bad that people refuse to get away from their sin. And now even in, and we see it in America, even more prevalent now than ever, people want to debate about their sin. They're like, well, I don't see what's wrong with it. Well, you know, this is what the Bible says. Well, I was written a long time ago. We, we live in a different day now. You know, they want to debate about sin. Guys, that's a bad place to be. But the culture is it. Well, it's, there's nothing new in the sun. Rome was the same way. And he's talking about Christian folks here. He's not talking about sinners. He's talking about Christian folk right here. He says, uh, he says, you don't understand that through that rebellion, you're storing up terrible punishment for yourself. People don't understand that sin is going to make you go through hell. And I don't mean on earth. I mean literal, physical hell. And you don't want to go there. And I don't want you to go there. Amen. He says, for a day of anger is coming when God's righteous judgment will be revealed. He will judge everyone according to what they have done. He will give eternal life to those who keep uh, on doing good, seeking after the glory and honor and immortality that God offers. But he will pour out his anger and wrath on those who live for themselves, who refuse to obey the truth and instead live lives of wickedness. I don't see how God can make it any clearer. He says, you know what? One day you're going to answer for your sin. And when we answer for our sin, it's not going to be a good day if we're still in sin. It's going to be a day of wrath. It's not going to be a day of mercy. All these people that are spouting out, God is love and God loves me just like I am. And they've they got an ounce of truth, but a pound of lie. What I mean, yes, God is love. God loves everybody. He loves them all the same. He loves me as much as he loves uh, any pedophile out there. Our, his love for me is the same as theirs. I choose to respond to that love and live my life according to that love. They don't. They, they, they can split hell wide open with God loving them as much as he loves me. That's the love of God's not in question. What is in question is the judgment of God. 
the judgment of God. And that's something we cannot, we cannot escape. Everyone will face the judgment. The Bible says it's appointed man once to, to die and then the judgment. Everyone will face judgment for what they do. Us, as saints, we get judged and we get rewarded for the good things we have done. The sinners get judged for the wrong they've done and they get rewarded with punishment and hell. Amen. Now, he says in verse 9, he says, there will be trouble and calamity for everyone who keeps on doing what is evil. I don't know how many times I want to just, uh, in talking to different people, trying to witness to them to the Lord, trying to tell them. And you, you ever tried to witness somebody and you say, hey, you know what would make your life better? You need to give your life to Jesus. And they just don't. But they keep on running into trouble and problem and trouble and problem and trouble and problem. You know why? Because the Bible says they will. The Bible says, you know what? You keep doing wrong. Trouble's around the corner. <laughs> it's, you're just asking for trouble. You're just asking for things to go wrong. And then I've even had people, I just don't understand what the problem is. And you just want to smack them. You just want to say, the problem is you're not serving God. And because you're not serving God, bad things happen when you don't serve God. Well, I thought God loves me. He does love you. He cares about you deeply. He made a way for you to live a life of blessing and prosperity. But you've got to, to live his life that he has for you. Amen? Amen. I always refer to this. People who, it's like complaining to the cop. I don't know what the speed limit is down here tomorrow, 50, 45 on that side, whatever. I don't know what it is. But if I go out here and I just say, you know what, I want to get home in a hurry, and I go 90, running every red light, zoom, 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 and then a cop pulls me over, I can't say, well, you're just being mean to me. <laughs> I don't see you pulling all anybody else over. I don't see you doing anything to them. Well, they're not breaking the law. They're not driving like an idiot. They're not, they're not doing something that everybody knows you shouldn't be doing. And signs are clearly posted, don't do this, don't do that, don't do this. But, hey, I'm in a car, it'll go that fast, I want it to go that fast, I'm just going to go. The cop's never going to be like, well, you know what, you're right, here you go, just, just keep on going. Never going to happen. The cop, and he could be the most kind cop in the world. He could be like, ask you how your day is, how are your day, and writing you a ticket all the time. There you go. Right? Now we accept that. As human beings, we know, yeah, you're not going to get away with that. And if you try to fight it, you may end up in jail. But when it comes to God, and God says, you know what? On God's highway, this is the speed limit. These are the rules. This is where you got to go. And this is how you got to drive it. We just think, well, I'm going for it. And then when God says, no, you can't do that. Why not, God? Don't you love me? This life's too hard to live. Try that next time you get pulled over. These rules are just too hard to follow. He's going to say, Sorry, that's the law. And sorry, and people when they get to God, you know what? They're going to be like, this life is too hard to live. I had to give up partying, and I had to give up sin, and I had to give up that, and I loved it all, and I just couldn't do it. It was too hard, and you made it too hard, God. You know he's going to say? Sorry, never knew you. Hell. Sorry, never knew you. Next. Now that's rough, <laughs> but that's the way, that's the deal. That's the deal. But God is kind. God is kind. And he keeps on going. He says, for those, uh, let me read it. He says, for the Jew first and also for the Gentile. Verse 11. For God does not show favoritism. When the Gentiles sin, they will be destroyed. Even though they never had God's written law. And the Jews, who do have God's law, will be judged by the law when they fail to obey it. You ever heard someone say, I don't want to know anything about the Bible because they don't have to answer for it. Nope. <laughs> Nope. Right here. It says, nope. It says, the Gentiles, when they sin, they're destroyed. He says, but you Jews, you have the law. You have the Pentateuch. You have the prophets. You have the law laid out before you, and you have it taught. But both you and the Gentile, the person who knows nothing, and the person who knows everything, will both be destroyed for sin. Both. He says, who have God's law will be judged by the law that they fail to obey it. Verse 13, for merely listening to the law doesn't make us right with God. It is obeying the law that makes us right in His sight. Man, if I could get people to understand that. That just coming to church and hearing me spout out scriptures doesn't make you right. 
doesn't help you one bit. It's obeying what the Word says. That's what makes it with God. Not how many times you can hear it, not how many times you can listen to it, not how many times we can watch it on TV. I, I, I don't care if you got a pair of earbuds and you piped nothing but preaching 24-7 into your ears. If you don't obey it, it means nothing to God. If you don't live it out, it's nothing. He says it right there in Romans. And what is happening in America? Guys, we have so much of the Word of God. We are so blessed with the gospel in our nation. It is on everywhere. It is on the internet. It is on the radio. FM, AM, Sirius Satellite Radio. It is on our TV. I remember when there used to be like one Christian station. That was like nine of them. There's all kinds of Christian stations. God, God is not hiding from us in America. We have churches on almost every block of every creed, color, denomination, whatever. There's no excuse for us. There was no excuse for Rome. Just like there's no excuse for us. He's saying the, the gospel is right there in front of you. It's right there. You can hear it. But in, unless you take that gospel and apply it to your life and live it, it doesn't do you any good. It doesn't do you any good. Amen. There's something about practicing it that matters to God. And it's the same thing that matters to us. If you go and get a degree, on I don't care what you get your degree on, degree on whatever you want to do, it will not ever make up for experience. You may know it. I could go and read a handbook on Ford industry and Say, I know everything there is to know about Ford industry. I know how the finances work. I know how the, the, the factories work, everything. I will never be able to say, I know it all. Now make me the CEO. No. No. There's something for practice. There's something for experience. There's something along learning how to do it. That's the Christian walk. When you hear the gospel, that's great. Hearing increases faith. So what the Bible says, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Meaning, when you get to hear the word of God and you actually listen to it, it will increase your faith. You will want to believe. You will want to live that life out. But unless you take the action to do it, it's just going to fall by the wayside. So it's up to us to take action. He goes, he says, for merely listening, I already read that. Let's go to verse 14. Even Gentiles who do not have God's written law, show that they know his law when they instinctively obey it, even without having heard it. We call it a conscience. Call everyone. They demonstrate that God's law is written in their hearts. For their own conscience and thoughts either accuse them or tell them they are doing right. And this is the message I proclaim, that the day is coming when God, through Christ Jesus, will judge everyone's secret life. Wow. That's scary. That's scary. I heard one preacher say it this way, and I've always liked it. And I have PowerPoint now, so I could, so I can do it. What would your actions be? How would you respond in this very moment if I said, "Okay, you didn't know this, but for the past year, we followed you around with cameras everywhere, and we have your every action on film, and we're about to play the movie right now." How many of you be like heading for the door? Oh no, I, don't show that. Don't, Pastor, don't show that because mom and dad don't even know about that. You know, spouse doesn't even know about that. Nobody knows about that. That's just, that's just me and, and, and no. Nobody needs to air that. What we don't realize is that is what God sees every single day. Nothing is hidden from him. He sees it all. So when we think we're getting away with sin, we're not. When we think, well, Pastor's my buddy. Pastor likes me. Yeah. It ain't going to help you. Yeah. I wish I, would, I wish I had that kind of clout, but I don't. I wish when Judgment Day gets up there and we're standing before God that I can look over and be like, well, yeah, I know James. He's my buddy. God, let him in. He's a good guy. Let him in. Let him in. You know what? God's not going to ask me my opinion. And he's not going to ask James' opinion about me. I'm going to stand there, me, my life, my actions, his sight, his knowledge, and the word. And that's what it's going to be. And he's going to say, this is the word. 
This is what my word declares. This is what it is. Do you measure up or don't you? That's, that's, and that's scary, gang. And I know that's scary. It's scary to even ponder it right now. But thank God for the blood of Jesus. Thank God for grace. So that every, because that's what's awesome. Because how many of you would be more comfortable with that if I said we recorded you, recorded everything you did, every action, everything. Not only action, somehow we had technology, every thought you had. We can put it up there. That's scary. That's scary. But how many of you would be more easy to say, but you know what? I erased all the bad. I went and I edited all the footage and you come out like a saint. How many of you would be like, well, then play it, Pastor? <laughs> Amen. You'd be like, then play that. Roll that footage. I want to see me. Yeah. Right. We would because that's who we are. We'd be like, yeah, I want to see that. That's what the blood <laughs> that's what the blood of Jesus does for us. The Bible says that he cast it in the sea of forgetfulness, never to be remembered again. I, I, one of my favorite verses in the word of God is that he took all the ordinances that were written against us and he nailed them to his cross. That means every bad thing that anybody has on me, any devil has on me, any person, anything in heaven, in earth or under the earth that has on me, he nailed it all to the cross and took it away. And guess what I come out looking like? A saint. A saint. Because he's going to look and be like, hey, I can't find it. It's covered in the blood. That's awesome. That's salvation. So guys, understand that God understands we make mistakes, but the blood covers us and that's why we can live this life. That's why we have grace. Uh, but we've got to start preaching and teaching that again to the people. Because a lot of people are going to wind up on Judgment Day and they're not going to be prepared for what they're getting. Because we've told them that, oh, it don't matter how you live, just come to church, just, you know, put a dollar in the plate and you're good. You know, Jesus and Bocephus, it gets you there. You know? And that's the culture. And a lot of people are believing that hook, line, and sinker. And the devil's just laughing because he knows what's coming. If anybody knows how harsh the judgment of God is, the devil knows it. He's faced it. He knows how harsh the judgment of God can be. So, understand, verse 15, let's go, let's keep on reading. He says, They demonstrate that God's law is written in their hearts for their own conscience and thoughts, either accuse them or tell them that they're doing right. And this is the message I proclaim, that a day is coming when God, through Jesus Christ, will judge everyone's secret life. You who call yourselves Jews are relying on God's law, and you boast about your special relationship with Him. Huh. Anybody ever witnessed somebody and they're like, hey, don't worry about me. Me and God got it worked out. Got our side deal. I promised Him I wouldn't, you know, say that, and we're good. No. God doesn't make any special deals on the side, He's not interested in side deals. The deal is Jesus. That's the deal. That's it. That's the deal. But he's talking to the church. He's like, now, nah, and, and, and I love the way Paul does things. Because Paul didn't pull no punches. Oh, great shooter. He said, I know a lot of you going around saying you got a secret thing with God. You, you, got, you and God are tight, and you got your own thing going because you promised him, I'll, I'll go to church at least three times a year, and we're gold. No. No. He says in verse 18, he says, you know what he wants. You know what is right because you've been taught his law. You are convinced that you are a guide for the blind and a light for people who are lost in darkness. That's what we should be. You think you can instruct the ignorant and teach children the ways of God. For you are certain that God's law gives you complete knowledge and truth. Well then, if you teach others, why don't you teach yourself? Wow. He says, if you've got it together and you and God are tight, and you've got it, why aren't you teaching those same principles, those same things, the same finger you're pointing out, why aren't you pointing it in the mirror to yourself to make sure you're clean? Jesus said it this way. He said, don't worry about the plank of wood in your brother's eye, or the speck of wood that's in your brother's eye, and not worry about the plank that's in your own. Amen? Don't worry about what all these other people have done. And I've been around Christians that are like this, not in this church, but 
uh, I've been around some Christians that are like this, that they know how to rail on the world like crazy. They know how to just, oh, they're filthy sinners and they're going to hell and they're this and they're that and they're this and they're that. And I'm thinking, that's great that you can say all that, but where is your love? Where is your compassion? Where is the mercy of God that's supposed to be inside of you that fills your life up? Where is the love, the mercy, the heart for those people? Amen? Because that's what the heart of God is. If you want to know where the heart of God is, it's John 3.16, and you know that, and it's the, 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 where, where God says that it's not His will that any should perish. God doesn't want anybody going to hell. Nobody. And that's hard for us to fathom sometimes because a lot of times we meet people that we think, man, they deserve it. Right? We think, man, they deserve it. But in God's sight, he's like, no, my son bled for them all. Died for them all. He says, if you know this stuff, if you know what's good, if you know what's right, if you know what's wrong, why don't you teach yourself? He says, you tell others not to steal, but do you steal? You say it's wrong to commit adultery, but do you commit adultery? You condemn idolatry, but do you use items stolen from pagan temples? You are so proud of knowing the law, but you dishonor God by breaking it. This is why I tell people, it's not about how much scripture you can quote. It's not about how theological you can get. It's not about how much Greek or Hebrew you know. It's about, are you keeping the law? Are you keeping the word of God? If you are living it out, That trumps every theologian. That trumps every master of the gospel who can quote it inside and out, backwards and front, has it memorized every jot, every tittle. If they're not obeying it, it means nothing. He says, no wonder the scriptures say the Gentiles blaspheme the name of God because of you. Man, he's hitting heavy now. He's saying, you are part of the problem, not the solution. He said, you guys that are supposed to be the light of the world, you guys that are supposed to live this life before men so they can see the grace and mercy of God and what God can do in a person. He said, but because you're not living it yourself, because you you think you got it, but you don't have it, and you're not really concerned about how well you have it, what you're doing, other people from the outside are looking at you and being like, their God's a joke. Their God's a joke. Why? Because... They, t- they say, you know, they get on to me because of this and that, but look what they're doing. And guys, we know, we know that if we're being honest with ourselves, and your pastor included, there are times when I should have behaved better to be a better light, and I didn't. And I had to repent and say, God, man, I blew it. I had an opportunity to be the light of the world, and boy, I was just another jerk like everybody else. We've all had those moments. But the great thing of it is, God wants us to learn from those moments and, and not repeat them. And be, be what we're supposed to be. In verse 25, he says, The Jewish ceremony of circumcision has value only if it obeys God's law. But if you don't obey God's law, you are no better off than an uncircumcised Gentile. And if the Gentiles obey God's law, won't God declare them to be his own people? In fact, uncircumcised Gentiles who keep God's law will condemn you Jews who are circumcised and possess God's law but don't obey it. For you are not a true Jew just because you were born of Jewish parents and because you have gone through the ceremony of circumcision. No, a true Jew is one whose heart is right with God. What Paul is saying to them, now we don't debate about circumcision today because it's done in the hospital. It's done in the hospital. But back then, the Jews were adamant. It was Moses and circumcision. That's the way you had to do it. That if you weren't circumcised, then you weren't of God. And all of a sudden, Jesus comes in and starts talking about grace and talking about faith in God more than just works in God. And all of a sudden, people are getting saved. Gentiles are getting saved. Well, the Jews are getting up and they're saying, no, 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 no. That's fine. You can have Jesus. You can have grace. But you've got to have this too. Because this doesn't... This, this isn't good until it's done. Guys, what he's saying here is religious tradition and religious rule will never trump the touch of God, the touch of Jesus, the faith that a person has, a person has in God. It'll never trump. Because we all have rules. We all have little things 
that we think should be done. We all have them. We, we were raised with them. We were raised. No matter how your mom, your dad, there's certain things that don't fly in your home that do fly in other people's homes. And, and, and if you've been a parent for a while, you've already said that. I don't care what Johnny does. You are mine, and you don't do that. Right? Well, it's the same thing in church, guys. Everybody here, we grew up with different parents. Um, I don't know how many of you grew up in this church, but a lot of times we grew up in different churches with different people. And, and people had different set of rules and different set of things. And a lot of it is, is just personal opinion that really doesn't matter when it comes to God. It really doesn't matter. But what God is saying, he's like, don't get caught up on just the religious rule and miss a relationship with God. He said, because you Jews think you got it just because you were circumcised and you know how to pay your tithes. He says, but guys, listen, it's not just about that. He said, you've got to have a relationship with God. You have to be changed on the inside, not just the outside. Anybody, we can go get the worst sinner in town, give them a three-piece suit, give them a shower, give them a shave, teach them to speak Christianese, and they can pass off as a Christian. It's not about that. It's about the touch on the inside that matters. And if we can get Jesus to touch people on the inside, he'll take care of the rest. That's what's awesome about God. That's what's awesome. When Jesus touched me on the inside, believe you me, I did not look or think or act like a Christian. Because I was a sinner. But I was raised in it. And I could have hit under the fact, well, I'm good and going to heaven because my dad's a preacher. Dad knows God like this. I'm surely going to get in. It's not how it works. I can tell you one little story and then I'm going to quit. I remember one day I was small. I don't know how old I was, but probably not much older than Zen. And my dad was preaching a message, and it happened to be he was preaching on the rapture of the church. And about how one day we're going to be here, and all of a sudden, boom, we're gone. Everybody who trusts in Jesus, loves Jesus, is gone. You know, and only the sinners are left. Well, we get home from church that Sunday, and my mom's making uh, chicken in the kitchen, and I'm glued to her hip. I'm just following her around. She goes there. She's basically hitting me, stumbling over me. So I'm right there. And finally, she got frustrated. She's like, Chad, what are you, why are you here? Why are you here? And I said, Mom, if you go in the rapture, I'm just going to hang on to you. <laughs> and we'll go. Yeah. And, yeah, exactly. I'm just going to go. And, and, I, and, I, and I love the fact that she took this moment to teach me because she didn't look down and say, oh, you're so cute and go on. No. She got down in my face. And she said, honey, it doesn't work that way. You can't go to heaven on what mama's got. You got to go to heaven on what you got. And believe you me, those words comforted me and they terrified me when I was out in sin. Because all of a sudden I couldn't be like, well, it's okay. You know, my granddad was a minister. My dad's a minister. Man, you know, we're good with God. No, it don't matter. I have to answer for me. And you have to answer for you. So it doesn't matter what mom and dad does or what everybody else does. It's what you got. That you will answer for. And this is what he's trying to break down to the Jewish people. He's saying, guys, you think that you're good with God because you went to church last Sunday. He's like, no, that's not what it takes. He said, you get good with God when you give him your heart and you give him your all. And, and they're just repeating what Jesus told them so many times before this. Many years before this. Jesus was speaking to the Pharisees one day and he said, he started commending them. He said, guys, you guys can keep the law like it's nobody's business. He's like, you guys, you never miss uh, a Sabbath. You never break the law. You never eat with dirty hands. You never, you never do anything. You, you keep the Sabbath. You tithe even to the thinnest of mint. You tithe it. He said, but you know what you've forsaken? Love. He's like, you love religion, but you don't love God. And guys, there's a lot of people that love religion, but don't love God. And when you get the love of God, religion makes sense. Because there's a place for religion. I'm not, I'm not bad, uh, bad-mouthing religion, but understand, it takes more than what we can do on the outside. It takes a relationship with God on the inside. That's what he's telling us. Let's read verse 29. Real quick. It says, No, a true Jew is one whose heart is right with God. And true circumcision is not merely obeying the letter of the law. Rather, it is a change of the heart produced by the Spirit. And a person, who is, who, person with a changed heart seeks praise from God not from people. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Guys, what we do should not be like, well, I'm going to show Gina just how churchy I am today. Amen? Amen? It cracks me up as a pastor. As a pastor, 
whenever I talk to someone who is not churched, and I talk to a sinner, and I don't even like to tell them that I'm a pastor, because we can have a conversation, a real good conversation, until I say I'm a pastor. And then immediately, they turn into a saint. Because I'm like, you know, hey, well, how are you doing? Yeah, you know, I like that sports team. You like this sport? Yeah, this is mine. It's, you know, whatever. We're having a good conversation. We're, yeah, you know, just talking like two old friends, two buddies. You know, oh, what do you do for a living, Chad? Oh, I'm a pastor. Well, I love God, too. God's so important to me. He's the biggest thing in my life. I wouldn't know what I'd do without God. They're lying. Because somehow they think that they're going to get in with God if I think, man, yeah, I'm going to let the big guy know. You're the real deal. I ran into you. I'm going to let him know. Yeah. He, he, so he told me how much he loved you, God. Don't work that way. I had a pastor named Brother Davidson. And uh, 